And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I've got, I have a returning brother, and I've got a newcomer to the temple. First, the two, the one-two punch. That is, that is the creation of righteous blood, ruthless blades. In the blue corner, we have we have return we have returning for his well third entry into the temple, Brendan Davis. And in in the red corner, in the newcomer end of things, a man for a man of many talents, a man formerly known as Deathblade by some, the one and only Jeremy By. How are you two doing today, man? Doing really good. I am doing great. So, admit, admittedly, I was um, I was very te I was very tempted to to see to see if I could commission an artist to to do some sort of some sort of homage to the whole X Men versus Street Fighter handshake when it came to this particular project. But the first thing I'd the first thing I'd like to get it like to get into is Jeremy, how, what where did your interest in um, Wuxia really start? It started with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, when that and incidentally, I don't want to. I'll, I'll give you the the cliff notes, but before I get into it, um, if you go to my website, which is jeremybuy.com, I have a little summary, and then there's also a link there to my YouTube channel. I have a whole video where I get into how I became a translator, mm -hmm. how I got into these genres, and the the, the origin of my Deathblade name. Mm -hmm. But long story short was it was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It really just captured my attention. And uh, it wasn't like I went out after, you know, the minute after watching the movie and started learning Chinese. But that started me down a path of uh, watching a bunch of movies, reading a bunch of translations, eventually uh, learning Chinese and moving to China. And it's a little more complicated than that. I don't want to make it sound like literally I've learned Chinese and moved to China just because of Wuxia and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It was more like that started me down the path. And uh, then eventually while I was in China, I ended up uh, in the initial... Initially it was in an effort to improve my reading ability in Chinese that I started doing translating mm. uh, just for fun. And then that eventually led into doing it uh, for a living. And then... Here we are. Yeah. Now, the the follow up that I have to that is pre previous to um, this coll this collaboration with Brennan. Did you ha did you have a fair amount of experience when it came to role playing games, or was this, or is this kind of your crash course in the matter? No, I've I I don't want to make it sound like I'm I'm like a super hardcore uh, tabletop role playing gamer, but mm -hmm. I have been playing role-playing games for many years now i gotta i gotta you know explain a little bit more in detail and i don't want to get too complicated but i come from a kind of you know, i come from one of those families where playing these kind of games was looked was was not really tolerated you know the whole you know dungeons and dragons you know you know devil demon stuff yeah the, yeah, the panic i know all well, about and, that this was something De Deathblade and I had in common too, actually, growing up. So, like, in fact, I think me and Brennan have talked about this before, I think on one of our podcasts, but basically, I remember the first actual role playing game I purchased, uh, which was the X Men role playing game. And this would have been probably in the early 90s. I can't, so I mean, it was in a box set and stuff. And my parents didn't really have any idea what it was. Like, I said, hey, I want to buy this X Men game. And they're like, uh, all right. So they took me to the game shop and I bought it. I brought it home and I had zero, literally no experience. I didn't even know what it was. And I was like reading through the rule book, like totally confused. Like, what is this? And then they somehow realized what it was and made me return it. <laughs> and so that was my initial uh, first role playing game. Then years later, I actually did, that got a little bit into I, I, when I had my freedom, so to speak. It was actually the Star Wars D20 system that I really got into. I was the or uh, the Game Master, I think it's called, in, in Star Wars D20 back in the day. Uh, I ran a pretty extensive campaign uh, for my friends back, I guess this would have been in the early 2000s. And then over the years, I've done, you know, gaming here and there with different systems, primarily like Pathfinder mm -hmm. uh, and Dungeons and & Dragons. Primarily the 5th edition, I think I did, 
I can't remember what I played because I was in China and I had friends that we played a little bit. I, I may have we may have played three point five or fourth edition. I honestly don't really remember too clearly. Mm -hmm. But uh, in any case, so coming into this, I definitely had some experience, and I was working with Brendan when he was doing Wandering Heroes of Ogre at the very first version. That was kind of how we initially met because it was during the translation boom of the you know early uh, in the, like twenty fifteen or so. He was working on Ogre Gate, and we ended up kind of. Um, getting into communication, and I was uh, part of one of his playtest groups toward the end. I think he had already finished, and it was like in the production was, cycle that yeah, I actually to clarify, he was part of my regular. It wasn't just a playtest group; that was like my d weekly campaign that he was in. Mm -hmm. And um, and and he actually played. He played a character named Hidden Arrow, and he also played a character named Constable By. And right. so, he, and he, so he was pretty instrumental in the like before Ogre Gate even came out. He was. Uh, you know, they're kind of helping me with, you know, some of the questions that I had and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then after that, he also, he and I worked on, um, uh, the tournament of Dalo book together and, but I'll, I'll let Jeremy finish the, uh, <laughs> the role play question. Uh, I, I would say that's pretty much the, yeah, that's kind of the end of the story. And, uh, the tournament of Dalu came about because as I was involved with the play testing and the, his regular campaign, and the getting digging into wandering heroes of ogre gate i just really liked the lore and the history of the world that he had uh, that had been created and so i suggested to brendan that i write a serialized like web novel uh talking about or featuring the two primary like uh, mythological or legendary figures in the ogre gate universe which was sunan and bao and so he agreed so i did that and i uh, eventually published that on Amazon. Uh, it's called Legends of Ogre Gate. Mm -hmm. And the Tournament of Dalu was basically kind of uh, tied into how I developed Dalu the city. Because if, if I remember correctly, in the Wandering Heroes of Ogre Gate, the main uh, rule book, it's just mentioned, if I, I think, or it's, my, it's on a map or something, but I ended up having that be a main setting. And so I developed the city out and whatnot. And so we kind of decided to tie in the Legends of Ogre Gate to some actual play material. Yeah. Now... Take, taking that into account and give, given the um, given the relationship that you guys have developed through Ogre Gate, um, talk to me about when about when the first seed was when it came to the development of Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, and what you want what you wanted to do that was going to be different from um, Ogre Gate, especially since both of them, sure. unless I'm mistaken, are still using. Um, the network system that was in Ogre Gate. Well, it's a very mm -hmm. radically altered version of the network system. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you want to answer this? Or should I answer this question? I'll start with a super quick intro, then you take over. Okay. Because basically, I remember Brendan emailing me, or maybe it was, I forget if it was email or call, kind of telling me that uh, Osprey was talking to him about wanting to develop this game. It wasn't like we just decided on our own, hey, let's do this. They, they were interested in... I distinctly remember why, which was uh, many years ago, they were apparently uh, under the impression that they might try to publish some uh, translations of Gulong's novels. Uh, ultimately, that... But uh, what happened was um, I, I got a, ca a call from or an email from someone at Osprey mm -hmm. and they had seen Ogre Gate at a convention and they, you know, back when we still had them and they 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 were interested in, in doing a Wuxia RPG and they kind of told me what they wanted. And I, I asked if I could do it with a co-writer because I had, you know, I had already worked with Deathblade on the tournament of Daolu and mm -hmm. we, we had also worked together kind of on the... Um, when he was doing the Legends of Ogre Gate, because he would he would ask me questions about the um, 
about the setting or something or and i would have to read chapters to give him feedback like he wrote it but like he would kind of you know uh, you know send me questions about things and stuff like that and so i just felt that we worked well together and i wanted to uh bring him in on the project and it just seemed like a good fit and so and then we talked about what we wanted to do and we and we both we, we both had in common an interest in in the gulong style of wuxia mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and so we thought that would be a, a more interesting angle to take a darker angle and we also wanted to do something that learn the lessons of ogre gate because ogre gate is uh you know it, it, we, we had time to see what's hard to do when you're running ogre gate what areas of it are are difficult or challenging and also what what is something that we'd like to do that we just weren't able to do in ogre gate because ogre gate was a certain way do you know what i mean so mm -hmm. it was it was an opportunity to to you know take another approach and see if that worked and and also i i love osprey books so i was a big fan of osprey so when that offer came along I was more than happy to uh, to to be involved because I, I they've they you know I always have Osprey books on my shelf so it's uh, and so then, I, on, in terms of mechanically as well I just wanted to point out that one of the things I feel like this was like almost from the very first conversation we had about it before we talked about anything else maybe I'm misremembering but basically one of the things we agreed on from the very beginning was that we wanted the combat to be fast and kind of brutal because. Yeah. Gulong stories, which was the initial inspiration, we kind of branched out from there later on. But basically, a lot of the times in his stories, the fights are kind of come across more like uh, samurai Chambara movie fights, where like mm -hmm. there's a face off and then a clash and then somebody dies, and that happens a lot in the Gulong stories. And so we wanted to emulate that, and that's basically what happened. I think one of the there was somebody that. Um, tweeted at me fairly recently that they had run a session and one of their criticisms they weren't like overly critical they were just saying it was a little bit too like a brutal combat system for them they said that they understood why but they they kind of that was their one thing they didn't like about it and you know i guess that that's a matter of taste obviously but that is exactly what we were going for we wanted the top martial artists to be facing off and then there's a clash a flash of blades and then one of them dies and that doesn't happen every time and there are even obviously situations where two perfectly matched opponents you know based on their techniques or whatever they might not even be able to hit each other and you know that's yeah. a possibility but generally speaking it's supposed to be like wham bam combat is over in a couple rounds and mm -hmm. that was one of the very early visions we had for the game that yeah. ended up becoming a reality yeah and honestly, that's the kind of feedback we kind of wanted to get. Like, you know, like obviously, if it's too lethal for somebody, it's that's personal preference. But like, it, we kind of want to hear some people are getting that reaction because that means that 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 it got what we were going for. Um, like, I remember when I was here before Mildred for Strange Tales, I told you that one of my concerns was making sure character creation was really fast so characters mm -hmm. could get into the session really quickly. So I timed character creation, and with Righteous Blood we took like an opposite approach where we timed combat because combat was, we wanted that to be quick and brutal. And so we made a point of timing it in some of the very early play tests. And, and, you know, I, I think we did a, a, a quite a good job of getting that aspect of the, the Gulong stuff. Also something people might notice is a lot of the movies that are based on Gulong don't do that. They're kind of more extended combat scenes often. Um, so it is something that you, you might only get if you just read the books. If you don't, if you see the movies, you might miss that detail. Yeah, and I get the feeling that the the whole the whole brutal the whole brutal combat association is is something that's is something that's ultimately born because of the fact that that particular style of style of um, wuxia isn't what a lot of people think of when they think when they think of the medium, and. I did want to go. I did want to go a bit more into that. Now you had des you had described it a bit as um cha as Chanbra, in ter in terms of comparative. But what would be f what would be a few um, media examples that you that you can think that you can think of? Since um Brandon, when I had you on f for um strange for strange tales of Songling, we ended up going quite a bit into that into that particular motif, and you giving me a extensive crash course on yeah. stuff like Mister Vampire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think both of us agreed that Hero, uh, Heroes Shed No Tears was like a very, uh, was sort of common ground for both of us. Jeremy's actually translated it, so he, he knows it very well. Um, and I like his translation, and I like the movie. And that 
that to me is uh you know one of the books that that i kept going back to um and i think you know obviously uh the the magic blade or the um uh what is it horizon bright moon saber jeremy for the yeah. uh yeah the, the story um and i know you have uh, you had a story that was of particular interest to you too i think um well, that i want to take up started- all yeah, I mean, since we we started out from the Gulong side, I obviously have a, a preference for not a preference, but like I'm I'm biased toward my own translation. Not mm-hmm. okay. I'm, let me walk back in. Not that I necessarily prefer it, just I'm more familiar with the stuff I've translated. So obviously that kind of comes to mind first. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the two like you mentioned, Heroes Shed No Tears and Seven Killers, in terms of translations, I really liked. Also, uh, not my translation, but by the same author is Sentimental Swordsman, Ruthless Swords. Um, and in terms of the movies, in the book we have a crash. We have what we call the Wuxia yeah. Crash Course, which is three movies, and I think we recommend two books. The mm-hmm. books are already mentioned: Heroes Shed No Tears, Seven Killers, and Horizon Bright Moon Saber. And then the movies are um, uh, Bride with White Hair, Hero. Uh, sorry, I should slow down here. Magic Blade, Bride with White Hair, and uh, Reign of Assassins. Um, those are kind of what we consider to be. If you want to get an idea of what we were aiming for, that's it. I wanted to address something that I think you, what you were asked. I, I think I understood your question. Basically, regarding the the brutal combat system, I don't think you're going to find any specific movie that necessarily captures exactly what we're going for because cinematically, I don't think Gulong's fight scenes translate well, or at least there's not a director and an audience that's going to want to see a Wuxia movie where there's like no fighting. <laughs> it's kind of like the point of Wuxia movies. Um, and I'm not a film expert or a historical expert or whatever. I'm gonna. I would make a wild guess that considering a lot of cinematic influence in in China and Chinese culture came from like opera and those kind of portrayals of heroic, you know, stories or whatever. I'm gonna guess there's a crossover there, and just that's just not what Wuxia yeah. is on film, at least. Well, I I, w- I would say for film, one it's not Gulong, but like King Hu movies, I think are closer to that yeah, style. That's yeah, yeah, that's true. He, they they do have a little bit more of that that feel. But um, I, I mentioned the Chambara. I think that in terms of film, so so here's the thing. And again, I want to clarify: I don't claim to be some sort of scholarly expert about all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I just I'm kind of like a like an upgraded fanboy maybe and I had to have a lot of background in terms of language and the culture and the translating stuff but I my understanding is that Gulong had a lot of influences from foreign um media and if you look at uh his uh, his sort of like storytelling and stuff I think that there's a lot of Western and spaghetti Western influence and probably samurai movies as well. I, again, I'm just, this is just There's, like guessing, I think. Do you, well, I, do you, if you don't, if you don't mind me asking, do you suppose that there might also be an element of um, film noir in his, in his work? I, I, th- I think there's definitely like, and again, I'm neither of us are, are like experts on this, but mm-hmm. like, I, I feel, I feel like uh, I see a lot of, uh, crime movie stuff a lot of crime story stuff a lot of noir and 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 uh and even things like james bond i think you see like like with the way that uh the way that like special objects work in some of the stories and stuff that kind of has like a there sometimes feels like there's a james bond quality um and uh but like he has one story for example that like i if you've ever read the godfather or seen the Mm -hmm. movie there there's strong similarities between this story and and the godfather and uh and it's the the movie is is killer clans i'm trying to remember the name of the story the story the story i've only been able to find a partial translation of so i haven't been able to read the whole thing the whole way through it's only about halfway translated i think but it was very similar to the godfather and the movie killer clans you know, it has like a Luca Brasi type character. It's got a similar type of situation. There's a lot. There's a lot of similarities going on. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think either of us would be able to say like definitively. This is definitely you know, like we're not scholars of Gulong. Yeah. In that yeah. respect, but it, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that there is a book that came. I'm pretty sure fairly recently that uh, I think it's a Gulong biography or something. It's in Chinese, and I haven't 
had a chance to read it. I kind of wish that I, I really should read it so that I know more what I'm talking about. Because I, I did try to do some research online about this subject and I wasn't really able to come up with much. So maybe that book uh, can can shed some light on it. But all I know is I think you're right, Brendan. I think that he was definitely getting his influence from from a lot of places. And so that's why I think if you're going to get a cinematic it's like window into it, Wusha movies... I don't think necessarily correlate perfectly to his fight scenes, at least. Like yeah. he, a ton of his stories have been translated into film, but in terms of the actual fight scenes, they obviously wanted to make them more exciting for the screen. Mm -hmm. And I really, and my personal opinion, I'm not saying Gulong took influence from spaghetti westerns, but if you watch spaghetti westerns, there's so many of them that I'm watching it. I'm like, this is a Gulong story. If you replace <laughs> the swords with, you replace the guns with swords and give them different outfits and a little bit, it's. Like whether it's um, Once Upon a Time in the West or there's one called, I think it's called My Name is Nobody or something. I'm watching it. I'm like every single fight scene, it could be a Wusha fight scene. And it seems like it's from a Gulong story. Like they, to me, perfectly encapsulate the feel and the tension and all that stuff. I will admit that one one other bit of media that, um, and obvi obviously by referencing this, according to some traditionalists, I'm being, I'm, um, I'm break, um, breaking taboos by by doing this, but when I looked at some when I looked at some of the art for um, Righteous Blood, Ruthless Blades, something that one thing that I ended up being reminded of, and this is admittedly a bit of a hidden gem to some, is the Rainblood series, um, which was which is a, a which is a series of video games. Um, Two of the, two of them are more in an RPG like approach, and one of them is more of a character action approach. Um, first one was a mini RPG called Rainblood Town of Death. Um, the se the second was um, City of Flame, which unfortunately I, I don't I haven't been able to try out because that one hasn't been translated last I checked. And then there was um, Rainblood Chronicles Mirage, which was a bit more of an action game. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak for the artist, but I, I don't play video games, so I don't really... I There's pretty much zero video game influence on in anything I do. I don't know if Jeremy plays... I, I don't know what his video game mm -hmm. situation is, so maybe he has more knowledge of that. Well, I I was... I'm a big gamer mm -hmm. growing up. Um, after getting involved with real life and moving to China and having kids and stuff, I'm not as much of a, a gamer as I used to be. Uh, in terms of the art itself, I can't, uh, similar to Brendan, I can't speak for him. So the artist is Kagan McLeod. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a story behind that. The the Osprey people went through a, a big process trying to find people who they felt were qualified and would be interested in this project, and they ended up on him. Uh, I was familiar with his work from many, many years before. He has a, a comic book series called Kung Fu. It's called Infinite Kung Fu, I think. Mm -hmm. And I... Pretty sure I bought the first couple issues from him personally at Comic Con in San Diego because I'm I'm from San Diego and I'm pretty sure I met him there, so I knew of his work and whatnot. And then, in terms of what he drew on for inspiration, I, I don't really know other than we initially started out with Chinese ink paintings. So if yeah. you look at the art, you'll you'll notice uh, you you kind of have to look closely in a lot of them, but there's usually some kind of ink like uh, stain or wash or whatever to make it kind of reminiscent of that. I do know that he was going for that. And obviously in terms of costumes and whatnot, there was a lot of stuff from Shaw Brothers movies. We didn't even ask for that, if I recall, Brendan. Maybe you did. I, I No, we, I, we were sending them, we had like a, there was a lot of back and forth. And I mean, I'm sure the, the Shaw Brothers stuff is probably mostly my responsibility or my, my fault, depending on how you look at it. But um, there was definitely Shaw Brothers stuff there. But there was also stuff where, I think we were both giving feedback on costuming for a variety of reasons. It mm -hmm. depended on the character and the situation. The, I mean, what you got to understand is when you when you work on a project like this, there. I mean, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but we would probably have like hundreds of emails over over the course yeah, of the for sure. And, and the and, thing is, and, I don't remember ever like I don't remember the like Osprey saying. So, what kind of costumes do you want? And then we were like, Oh, go look at some old Shaw Brothers movies. I'm pretty sure that Kagan is actually a fan of that stuff to begin with. So I think. I think, yeah, you might be right. You might, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Because the art started coming in, and I was like, I was actually really pleased with it because I was worried that it was gonna gonna be like, I, I don't know what I was worried it was gonna be. Just I was worried. 
afraid it was going to be not particularly authentic. And I think it just inherently was a lot more authentic than I thought yeah, it was going to be. I think most most of our feedback, if I remember, was like specific characters. And if something if, if something clashed with the setting thing, we might give you know feedback on that. Um, we also I know we, we kept saying we wanted more blood. I know that was a big thing we kept mm -hmm. asking for. Um, uh you know, I, but I, I, I mean, it was it was like a dizzying process, to be honest. So I really don't remember as well as I as I should. And also, I do art direction for my own games, and I get a lot of what I was doing with my other games with this confused in my memory. So, all right, I get, I, I got you. And f for what is for for what it's worth, um, the main part of the main reason that I ended up making the comparison is, um. Like Rainblood Town of Death is ve is very cl is very clearly rooted in um, noir fiction. For like what we call the glamour of of the Shaw Brothers vibe. Mm -hmm. in, well, well, like for example, there's a couple of hairstyles. I'm trying to find the image actually, and I'm not doing a good job. But the, <laughs> I think it's in the opening. There's a there's a picture of like four characters, mm -hmm. um, and they're all kind of crouched in front of a door. And I think the woman in that has she has a hairstyle that wouldn't have been totally historically accurate if I remember, um, but. You know, it's something that you saw in the movies all the time. Do you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing, you know, if it caught the glamour of that style, we wanted it in there a little bit because yeah. part of our idea was anachronistic history. Also, yeah. I wanted to mention, um, because you had asked about sources of inspiration and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, one thing I did want to say is if people are looking for, like, a published version of Gulong, they can get The 11th Sun. Mm -hmm. That's actually the first Gulong story I ever read. Um, apparently, it's only half of the story. Is from my uh, uh, Jeremy and my I'm family. Jump and... in here. I want to jump in here because number one is it is. Uh, I agree. Uh, sorry, it's my first one too. But I do want to point out, Brennan, because we had talked about this before, and I mentioned this in my uh, YouTube video about the, my top five Wusha recommendations. It is actually not half. It is a complete novel. So the version that you can get on Amazon is complete. That is. The, oh, it's the full, full, okay. full novel, but there's a sequel. So okay, it, yes okay. and no. Like there is a continuation of the story, but the way, like I used to think that the end of the translated version was like halfway through the actual novel. It's that's not the case. So the the ending you okay. get is the actual ending, but there's a follow up story that you can get that's okay. not translated okay. as far as I know. Well, well, and what's interesting because the and the follow up story is not in English as far as I know, but I I I've, I've read the Eleventh Son a number of times, and there's mm -hmm. a movie. Um, called The Swordsman and the Enchantress that's based on that material. And the movie has, like, there's a lot of, like, twists that happen in the movie that mm -hmm. do not happen in The Eleventh Son. And I'm very curious if uh, if they're present in the sequel novel because it totally changes how you see certain characters and all that. But but that's that's a book that people can obtain. And, and Jeremy had mentioned Reign of Assassins. And I, I do want to emphasize, I think that's a really good movie mm -hmm. uh, for getting a sense of just because he and I kept referring back to it a lot when we were working on things. So I feel like that's a, a really important one for people to see. Yeah. Now, when it came, when it came to, now, obviously, as, as was mentioned, this is using a very heavily modified version of the network system. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's a few things, there's a few things that I can clearly s see were, uh, were, ch were changed, but, what I'm curious about is what what were some of the things from the network system from from before that you guys had, had immediately decided, yeah, this isn't going to work for what we have for what we have in mind. Um, well, we knew we didn't. Well, I don't know if this is a network system thing, but definitely from aggregate, we were like, we cannot. Like I, I knew before we even started, this has to have way fewer um, techniques uh, in in total, but also in. Um, in terms of how many techniques a character can learn and it needs to be simpler and broader um and counters need to be pared down i just knew that from the fact that i'd heard from gms who had a hard time tracking all the techniques that i really wanted to bring that that complexity uh to a lower level mm -hmm. um i don't remember if from the very beginning if there were things that we were like this definitely has to go i don't know uh, I, I mean i guess you know, we we knew from the start that we were going to go more the strange tales direction in terms of defenses. Mm -hmm. um, so there weren't going to be six defenses, but I, I I don't recall there being a whole lot else at, at the starting point. Jeremy, do you have any different memory of that? Or and I think in terms of the network system in general, I don't think we identified anything that was specifically 
needing to be changed. That said, in contrast to Ogre Gate, there were a couple things, and this, this, some of these things came from my observations in playing Ogre Gate over the years, and there was a certain point where we did sit down and we were kind of like, all right, what are what are the the you know what are the skills we want to have? What are the uh, like? We're, well, you'll notice if you're familiar with Orgate that we took out um, the uh, it's called Dianxia. It's just the the different skills you can get are also different from Ogre Gate. And we'd spent a lot of time... And some of them were easy, like some of them just fell into place immediately, like, immediately. but in other ones, like the knowledge skills and, and whatnot, there was a lot of discussion as we tried to decide what to include, what not to include. Yeah. And there is a lot of difference uh, with yeah. Ogre Gate because of that. From what from what I've seen, if, if I was to put... If I was to put a... Um... If I was to put Ogre Gate and Songling on a um, sc on a uh, scale, um, would it be fair of me to say that 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 um, RBRB has more in has more in common with with um so with Songling mechanically than with Ogre Gate? I mean, I think that's fair. Um, in terms of the base, I feel like that was kind of, I feel like that was sort of just the base we were working off of. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So that's why there was. But 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 in terms of complexity and abilities, I think it actually still has a lot in common with Ogre Gate. So it's it's a, it's a little bit more of a mid, of a midpoint if you're just looking in terms of simplicity versus complexity. Yeah. But it's also really its own thing because it's stuff in in Righteous Blood that's not in either of those games. So mm -hmm. like the whole way eccentricities work, the, the uh fire deviation, the the death and maiming table, um and things that were ported in from Augregate were uh radically changed in many cases, like the way grudges work and stuff yeah. like that. And something else something else in character creation for Righteous Blood that I find interesting not just in not just in terms of a wuxia game but just in games in general is the final step of making a backup character which is something i've i've seen a few times but it's not something that i saw it's not something that i see often um was that was that something that was just that was just a admit just put in as an admission of the lethality of Righteous Blood, or what, or was there a different story in terms yeah. of why that particular phase was implemented in um, the character creation process? I mean, I don't remember the discussions that led it to being point nine in the character creation process, but I mean, th this is something that I think we both knew it was a lethal game, and making a backup character made sense. And I think that's something that I, I kind of do anyways. In my own. I usually tell people to make backup characters because I like to run relatively high high chance of death campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in this one especially, I don't know, Jeremy, you have any different memory of that? Like, I mean, basically that, but also you'll notice that we mentioned specifically that that uh, backup character comes into the game with a grudge. So if I remember, it sort of stemmed a little bit out of that as we were talking about grudges because uh, it's easy to kind of forget about that aspect, I think, if you're, you know, whether you're a game master or a player, uh, as you're... It, as you're kind of like going along creating the character or playing, it's it, it it could be a bit of time before a character dies, and there is supposed with grudges are such a big part of Wuxia. Yeah. We really wanted to emphasize that, and so in my rolls in a way that's not favorable your first mm -hmm. combat yeah no now obviously i will ad i will admit when it comes to when it comes to that whole lethality thing i i can't i can't speak too hard i can't speak too harshly on that kind of thing because well i've made it clear over the years one of my favorite rpgs is Legend of the Five Rings, which has been notorious for years with how lethal it, lethal it can get to the point where combat is 
is um, advised to be advo avoided when possible. But I'm curious if during playtests, did you have any? Did you guys have any instances of um, TPKs? I I I did. I I I. But I I frequently have that. I don't know if Jeremy did. Um... I didn't personally. Um, I was not happy with my play test session, not because of the game, but just because I, it, it was a busy time in my life and I didn't, pre I feel like I didn't prepare as well as I could have. And I basically, I think I didn't challenge my players enough and they, they actually wiped out <laughs> numerous enemies. And in retrospect, I, I wish I had made it a little bit more challenging for them. I didn't even have a single player death, which I kind of, bummed me out in my in the play testing i i did well let me i take that back we did some some kind of like uh, combat tests and whatnot and yeah. we had like a tournament and people yeah. fought each other and stuff mm -hmm. but in the main storyline none of my guys died although that said i wanted to jump back to something you had mentioned about um combat being not advisable i mean that's also why we put in the talking and analysis phase because yeah. we wanted the two have not only a, a buildup of tension leading to the fight like in the gulong fights but also, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a system where it's possible to one-shot somebody pretty easily, we wanted to give people an option to get out of it. And so we felt that it's not as though we were encouraging people not to fight, but we definitely wanted to have that option to, you know, to be in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, like, yeah, my, so my whole approach to playtesting, I, I, I have a bunch of rotating groups, so it's generally been... Because I have these established groups, it's very easy for me to just organize different play tests with different people. And so I always find that helpful. But when I started on this, I immediately started running combat play tests like every day. So like well, maybe not every day, but as much as I could. And 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 so I had ongoing combat play tests and I had uh, you know ongoing story campaign type play tests and one shot adventures and that sort of thing. Um and 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 so you know. Uh, but I, but, but again, me and Jeremy, we also have slightly different GMing styles. So I tend to, I, I, you know, I tend to attack players a little more ferociously. And, uh, and so a, a TPK is a more, just more likely when I'm running a game with regardless of the system, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, definitely there were, there were TPKs in both the campaigns and in the, um, and in the combat play mm -hmm. tests that I ran. Oh. Well, part of it probably has to do with that my playtest group wasn't like the let's chart, let's like storm the castle kind of people. They were yeah. like very careful and they they would run away. I, they didn't run away constantly, but they weren't the type that were trying to rush into every fight. So that probably had something to yeah. do with it as well. Yeah. Um, and when it co plus, I'd imagine that much much like much like how I've had to teach people out of out of certain habits with L five R. I look at the way Righteous Blood does things, and I get the sense that I get is that the is that people who ha, who um whose GM style largely revolves around crawls and and the like would mm. have a bit of an adjustment period. Not saying that they couldn't adjust, but that it's go it's that but that it's going to take some take some unlearning and relearning. Yeah, oh, like dungeon crawl type stuff. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean. Obviously, Ogre Gate had a lot of dungeon crawl elements to it, and in mm -hmm. this one, we were focused more on, you know, providing providing adventures that feel more like Magic Blade and stuff like that. So, yeah. uh, more like Come Drink with Me. I mean, it's it's definitely not it's not it's not particularly focused on that style of play. Um, and and it's it's also I feel like for dungeon crawls, like with, with whoosh, if you wanted to do a, a crawl in this game, it would really have to be a much more limited thing. Kind of like you would see in a movie like Web of Death, where they go into the tomb. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where it's like three or four rooms, and it's all mechanical traps. There's nothing supernatural in there. Do you know what I mean? Like you know, a, a, a D and D style dungeon is able to be so elaborate because of a number of reasons. So you can have all these supernatural things that help you really extend the concept of the dungeon. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, but I think if if you were to include dungeons in a game like this, and again, we do not really get into that territory in the book it would have to be much more like a harn type dungeon which is almost more like a a scenario around a structure than yeah. you know a dive into a, a complex that that's not really based in something that's as realistic do you know what i mean mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think the source material has a lot to do with that as well. It's not as though you see those kind of, you know, wuxia. There's no, you don't have very many wuxia dungeon crawl movies or books. Um, I, one of them, another that jumps to mind is Bride with White Hair Two. It's kind of like that. It's but it's more of like a heist heist yeah. situation than a dungeon crawl. So I think you could make it work, but we're our attempt was to emulate the genre it's the genre and as we mentioned in the i think in the character section the the stories are so character driven generally that that was what we were aiming for i mean that's why we had i, I at this point I, i'm not sure how many npcs are in there like 50 or 70 or something like that's why we There's had a lot so There's a lot and I, I mean i will say there is like i've i've commented on this in the past where there there are wuxia stories that have dungeons and they do feature like in the same way that you see them in like fantasy stories and stuff, they're not necessarily dungeon crawls, but you'll see dungeon like structures. But those are different kinds of stories than what we were going for here. So, like in a lot of Jin Yong stories, I do see things that look more like dungeons to me. And and even in some of the Gu Long books, but they're still more um they're they're much more limited in Gu Long books. Like like the, like they'll be trapped in a cave or something. Do you know what I mean? That lead you know, leads through a few chambers. It's not usually uh, you know, it's it's just not quite as elaborate. Um, but I, you know, I have no problem including dungeon material in a wuxia campaign. I just feel like for what we were going for, it was like Jeremy was saying, this is much more character driven stuff and much more um, about you know uh, feuds between people and about uh, the 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 clever weapons that they wield and you know who's the fastest draw of the sword, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and. And so, you know, it's, a, you know, but again, you know, I guess, you know, if you point at the, uh, you, you know, you could look at a book like the 11th Sun and that um, that structure that they, they, they find themselves in at the end, the sort of the the fake miniature uh, estate. And you yeah. could call, you could turn that into a dungeon in a game if you wanted to. But this is just not that kind of game. This makes me think of this is kind of getting off track here, but. I wanted to point out that this reminds me of a conversation I got in on Twitter recently where somebody was, I try, I really try not to get into online like discussions and arguments. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go back and forth maybe like more than two times with somebody just because I feel like it's pointless. But this person was not specifically talking about games, but they were talking about movies and they were talking about the wire work, the wire action mm -hmm. in Usha movies. Mm -hmm. And making some points about that and i essentially made the i i responded and i said like wuxia movies are not just about the wire work they were saying something yeah. along the lines of like if you added wire work to star wars you know something wuxia and i have a whole video talking about why i, I think that star wars is not wuxia i think it has influence obviously anyway the the point of what i'm saying is that I went back and forth with this person, and they just kept going back to the wire work over and over and over again, saying, well, wushu, wushu movies are known for the wire work, blah, 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 blah. And I think this relates to um, a, I don't want to say a misunderstanding, but let's just say a perception that a lot of people have regarding Wusha. And Brennan and I have talked about this on our podcast a lot. I think I think we have slightly different takes on it, and we've kind of gone back and forth, so he can yeah. jump in and give his opinion in a second. But my opinion is basically, I, I'm not criticizing it, People, but I think that a lot of people have a sort of very narrow view of what wuxia is, and I think a lot of people, and I, I, this is not scientific, but I think a lot of people have seen a few wuxia movies like Crouching Tiger yeah. or Hero or whatever, and they're like, "Wow, that's so cool!" And to them, the 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 wuxia aspect has to do with the flying around and the yeah. and the kung fu martial arts fights and all these different things. And while that stuff is important, I think there's a massive element to wuxia that is not related to that at all. Like, you can have wuxia movies without wire work. Like, there's yeah. a lot of them from many years that they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of relates to what we're talking about in that uh, whether you're talking about the dungeon crawl or or what else, there's more to wuxia than just the flying and the swords and stuff. And so if, if people are coming to any wuxia game, including ours, and that's what they're coming for. Be they're like, I want to, I want to do a, you know, I have a, I have a, dun I have a Dungeons and Dragons monk, and I want him to like fly around and like hit, throw his sword around and stuff. I mean, that's cool and stuff, but there's way more to Usha than that. And so we packed a lot of that other stuff into yeah. this. And so I think that is uh, a very important element to consider. Well, I, I guess where I'd weigh in is, um, I think that. Well, number one, like on the wire work thing, that's also a product of technology too, mm -hmm. right? Because like, um, you know, the old, 
the old uh, Wuxia movies, they were using like trampolines in like the 70s and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of, you know, like in the early 70s, late 60s, you see a lot of trampoline work. And then they, the wire work gets progressively better. And then that starts kind of driving the aesthetic itself. So I feel like when you get the movies, you're getting the movies are an interpretation of the books. So they're limited by whatever technology was available oh, at yeah. the time. And then there's also this question of, well, what's an essential feature of the genre? And what's like, like more of an accidental feature or a common trope, but not necessarily like, you know, like, like romance is something that's in a lot of Wuxia stories. It's, there's nothing wrong with you. You can have romance in there, but it, you don't have to have romance mm -hmm. in a Wuxia story. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think the other thing that sometimes happens is people, people like, sometimes they stifle genres like this because they're like, the genre needs to have these five things and then they won't allow other things into there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I, I've it's seen, not, I've seen that plenty of yeah. times in, with yeah. other, with other genres of fiction. And I've, Made no bones about the fact the fact that I am extremely critical of that mindset, and when it when it comes to, th honestly, when it comes to the whole, getting getting to that whole um th that whole thing you mentioned with Star Wars about about it really about whether or not it's um whether or not it's Wuxia, if I were if someone had brought that kind of conversation to me, I would have I would have said, you're dealing with a subject matter that dips its fingers into so many different ponds that tr that trying to narrow that trying to narrow it down to one thing or even a handful of things is pissing against the wind ultimately well and i think what, what we were trying to do with this game was we we weren't this is sort of what jeremy and i have said this is what we this is the kind of wuxia we wanted to bring to people do you know what mm -hmm. i mean this is this is like a style of wuxia that we both really appreciate and we wanted to bring it to a game and it was it was something that like you know like when i did ogre that was much broader it was much oh, yeah. more um you know it, it wasn't focused on this particular style of wuxia and we and we and also it was it had other genre elements so mm -hmm. it wasn't like pure wuxia and 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 this is an attempt to say okay if you want like dark Shaw brothers, dark Gulong stories, bride with white hair type stuff, that that's what you're going to get here. Um, I don't think either of us are claiming that it's definitive though. Like, you know, no. like there's, there's, there's plenty of Zhang Hu. That's kind of the point of how we approach the Zhang Hu is we were saying like every Wuxia writer makes their own Zhang Hu, right? Like yes. there's a Jin Yong one, there's a Gulong one and so on. And so this is our Zhang Hu. That's why it occupies such a big section of the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think much of the fun is sort of discovering, well, what's my Zhang Hu that I'm going to do that's, you know, it's rooted in Wuxia, it's still Wuxia, but like what's, you know, what's the, uh, you know, what are the aspects of it that I want to emphasize? Yeah. Um, and to be, yeah. to be quite honest, oh, so. um, something like RBRB is, is, uh, some, is, some, is something that I've, I'm not going to say this particular thing is something that I've clamored for for a while, but merely the merely the assumption that that it ha that it has to be a specific that it has to be this one specific br this one specific broad net ap broad net approach is mm -hmm. something I've been is something I've been critical of, and I haven't really I haven't really seen a more I haven't really seen a down a more for lack of a better term down to earth approach to it since um, Chin. And that okay. and that was that was a long time ago. Um, and Chin Chin wasn't Chin wasn't even as down to earth as what you guys are going for. But it certainly. But at that time, my I had very slim pickings because the the only um, choices I had when it came to when it came to Wuxia games was that and Weapons of the Gods. And while I enjoy Weapons of the Gods, um. I will freely admit that the the um, story that got that made me delve deeper into Wuxia as a whole wasn't that it was um, Fung Wan, um, or at the at the time I knew it as the Storm Riders. Okay, um, yeah, which also to me that's like uh, even like a little bit like, like higher level fantasy too, almost right? Like yeah, uh -huh. and I. Like I, I get what you're saying totally, and I wanted, uh, and I want to point out that uh, first of all, I have said before that as long as the group's having fun and you know everybody's having a good time, I think that's the most important thing, and people can be free to adapt 
our system or any system into their play style, leave stuff out, mm -hmm. add stuff, homebrew stuff. Like we encourage people to make their own Jianghu if they want. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't want to come across as, you know, like a gatekeeper or an elitist who is like, well, you don't really understand Wuxia or that kind of thing. So let's get that out of the way first. And I want to make mm -hmm. that disclaimer. Then I want to go into a kind of adjust what you were saying about like the down to earth nature. I would uh, totally agree with you about that. And that's definitely what we were going for. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I, I'm not an expert in all the other Wuxia systems that have been coming out recently. Um, I think a lot of them, and this is my bias, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that I, I'm open to criticism for this. I think a lot of it goes back to what I mentioned before, which is people wanting to emulate a f some some aspects of Wuxia that have become overblown in the Western version of what's available. So like the whole flying around and stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the wire work aspects. I like the flying. There's different versions of that between different um, movies. You know, the Crouching Tiger one got a lot of criticism from people because it's so, like, you know, um, artistic and floaty and stuff. And there's different versions. And and even going back many years, like, I watched... Brendan, I'm, have you seen The Wandering Swordsman? Um, 1970? There's wire work in it where he's, like, floating in the trees. Yeah. I was, like, I was that, surprised... That's... That's an er that's one of the early advancements, if I remember, in wire work. Because yeah, I remember yeah, being so. stunned by it when I saw that. Anyway, my point is just um, that over the years, my sort of fascination with Wuxia and interest in it has changed a lot. And when I f was younger and was first getting into it, obviously those flying around things and like the sword play aspects and the cool fight scenes really drew me in. As I've kind of gotten older, you know, I have kids, I've gone through multiple jobs, I've lived in different countries, I've experienced ups and downs and whatnot. I've, over the years, that flashy stuff has become less and less interesting to me. And what has become more and more interesting to me are the stories and the characters uh, and in, in the movies, the acting of actors and whatnot. Okay. And I think that probably had a big effect on this uh, in terms of the characters because uh, the flashy stuff is cool and the special effects are cool. But when it comes down to it, what I think um, creates an emotional connection to the story, whether it's a movie or a book, are the characters and the plot and the character development and stuff. And I think we tried to put a lot of that into Harvey Arby. Yeah, and I'll just say for me, I, I have to admit, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I have somewhat simple tastes. And so, I, you know, like I love seeing like the wire work and the flying around. And I, I find that liberating in the same way that music is liberating. And I like like 90s wuxia which has a lot of that but also to death blade's point i think if you watch a lot of like 60s and 70s shaw brothers it is a little more grounded because it doesn't have the elaborate wire work and a lot of the way that those movies are shot they're not edited in a highly stylized way you're getting kind of more of a you know just sort of like a golden age of hollywood type filmmaking and uh and so what what it end, tends to focus on is the characters and uh and 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 the portrayal of the characters on screen and so i think i think that the th the one thing that we were like very much on the same page with with this was focusing on characters and mm -hmm. uh especially with Gu Gu like if you read a gulong book the whole thing the thing that's so amazing about it is how he just he introduces characters and then he kills them in the next second he introduces these people that are like really well conceived interesting sometimes humorous or eccentric characters uh, by the dozens, just so that they can die at the hero's hand, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I think that we wanted to try to capture, you know, that, that the, and you see it in, in Jin Yong too, interesting characters. Interesting characters are, I think, one of the key things that really make Wuxia work as a genre. If, if, if you take out, if you take that out, it really is missing something. So uh, yeah. mechanically that fits into the game. Uh, well, m let me mechanically, by what I mean by mechanically is, uh, for people who are interested in role-playing games for the actual role-playing part of it, mm -hmm. there's so much stuff to dig into because uh, depending on how you build your character, you may or may not end up developing a lot of these eccentricities. And some of them are mental, some of them are physical. Yeah. Man, there is just like a gold mine of role-playing opportunities in there that I think just are... I mean, you could create so many characters and never come up with the same one, especially as they develop and gain these eccentricity well, and role play them and such so much potential for fun stuff. 
And the key thing I want to say about those is one part of the game that is different from other games in the network system is you have to take an eccentricity in this game. You have to be eccentric. That's mm -hmm. sort of a that's sort of a step one. So um, I and I think I think that's something that definitely pushes it into the sort of the gulong spirit. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing is is you had said so you had said something about it being down to earth. When we when we first started talking about making the game, one of the things that we actually wanted to do, you, you know, you talked about like the seventy characters or however any NPCs we have in the book. Um, we wanted to have every entry actually sound like a Gulong description, um, which probably would have been a lot less down to earth because it would have been very poetic and all that. And mm -hmm. we tried that and it didn't work. Like Jeremy might be able to weigh in here too because I think, uh, you know, I, I think he probably remembers the early yeah, phases of that yeah uh, i think i was it, it, my one of my initial tasks as we were breaking the workload down was to create the first set of like characters and i created i think i still have the document on my google drive where it was it was kind of like that i created these sort of like three sentence descriptions a few of them made it into the book actually like i think unraveled sword or maybe you wrote that one ben i forget but the point is a few of them are in there uh yeah i i if that was wouldn't have worked to do it with all of them um, another thing to point out, and this I, I, I feel like we need to mention this more more because we, we haven't mentioned it, is basically all of the characters are created as if they were just a player character. So they're basically yeah. all pre-generated characters. You can take any character and it's all statted out and has equipment and relationships and anything. So if you, if you don't want to create a character... You can just go in and pick one of the yeah. NPCs and it will be perfectly functional as a character. In, in fact, something I'm doing right now because I want to make sure that I'm you know, running the game while I'm talking about the game. And um, I, I, on my Friday group, I've been having players select randomly NPCs from the book. And then we just kind of come up with a two session scenario based on their backgrounds and their motivations. And it's, it's been pretty easy. So, so they definitely do work as backup characters. Um, yeah, and, and like Jeremy was saying, like there were a couple, like basically what happened was we, we wanted everything to be like really short, like one to three sentence descriptions and kind of have a poetic vibe. And we realized that just wasn't functional enough. But what ended up happening was in a few cases, some of those free sentence sections remained in the NPC entry. Yeah. So we have a few where you'll see these lines that are kind of striking. And it's because that's the sort of we wanted to keep that in there intentionally to retain some of that that vibe, but uh, we just couldn't we couldn't structure every NPC around it. It it just wasn't it just didn't work when we did it. Um, it was too vague. It was too vague was the problem. Yeah. Um, and also we kind of it's it, one of the reasons why it's hard for us to know who made which character is because. Often one of us would come up with the character, but then it would go through the filter of the other person who would, mm -hmm. who would sort of make additions and changes. And we did that a few times. Um, there were a handful of characters were like, this is definitely Jeremy's character. This is definitely Brendan's. Do not, you know, like we just knew we didn't have to have a conversation. But we just knew don't make big changes without cons consulting the person. Yeah. But there were a lot of characters where we were like, these guys just belong in the bucket of characters we know we, we need to have in the, in the game. Um, and those ones we were much more uh, freely kind of changing each other's ideas. Um, so I, the end result, I think, was pretty good. <laughs> I was, I was. Whenever I go back to it, I'm pretty impressed with the NPCs. Yeah, and I can. That's definitely something I can. I can see with a lot of them, and I do appreciate that with a lot of the NPC entries. There's the whole recent developments, which is basically a story seed for all intents. Um, yeah. But as as I've gone as I've gone through it, the reason I was a bit hesitant about using the using the term down to earth is it doesn't it didn't it didn't quite match what I was what I was trying to go for when I when I said that. Mm -hmm. But but I guess the I guess the um I guess the best way for me to make the analogy and this this and I'm I'm fully aware that this also doesn't qu doesn't quite match. But if you, if one were to look at um, a lot of the, a lot of the more popular, um, and a lot more popular in in terms of Western zeitgeist entries when it comes to wuxia, those would fall into the category of of some of some sort of some sort of high fa some sort of high fantasy. Whereas, oh, I see what you're saying. whereas I see. what I see out of um, Righteous Blood has more in common with swords and sorcery. 
Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's because it's more rooted in like the Gulong stories in the mm-hmm. 70s Shaw Brothers films. And also, I mean, Death Blade, you can dis- Jeremy, you can disagree with me if you want. I don't know if you f- agree with this observation, but I feel like what this game is is it's like it's very much it kind of stops after 2000. Like we obviously have movies in there from post 2000, mm-hmm. but we avoided a lot of the aesthetics that you tend to see in a lot of Wuxia series and a lot of Wuxia movies post 2000, where the CG is really, really heavy and you have a lo- just more fantastical elements, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Do you agree with that? Or would you say that that's. Yeah. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. And, and we, the thing was, we didn't want to make it like, you know, absolutely without magic, which is we obviously have the magical arts in there. And there are some of the techniques that are pretty fantastic, like the yin yang ones and the five elements ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you, you also have to have, you need to define what you mean by magic. Uh, in my mind, we never, I don't think we ever talked about this, Brennan, but in my mind, yin and yang, the five elements, and all the various things that make up traditional Chinese medicine and traditional traditional martial arts practice and stuff don't count as magic so mm-hmm. like lightness martial arts not magic in my mind um, yeah, and yeah, internal arts in you know inter- uh, manipulating the internal energy not magic either i mean people do that in real life you know whether whether or not you however much you believe whether qigong is real or not or whatever people do do that so i don't view that as being magic and so therefore um it's you know for the most part none of this stuff is is very magical at all even there's a handful of weapons that we have in there that we specifically list as being magic because we couldn't really come up with like a functional like <laughs> like a mundane explanation for them but that said it's not you know spell casting and like yeah. you know demons and and higher beings and that kind of thing yeah that, i mean the, that's the, that's the reason why i um was referring to sort was referring to sword and sorcery in this sense not not in terms of magic use but in terms of a very oh. a very uncomp a very uncompromising kind of wor- kind of world where oh. l- where life is life and death is on that razor's edge and it's the people who are able to keep their wits or keep or are able to uh, out outperf- outperform people that are able to survive yep yeah i mean i think um I think the high, like the the most magic we get is like the kind of stuff that you see in Web of Death. That's the stuff that maybe pushes the the envelope the most mm-hmm. in the game. Like there's a thing called Mother of Lightning, which I think could still have a mundane explanation, yeah. but that's kind of more in the realm of like the spider from Web of Death. Say, yeah. um, I you totally know. agree with that assessment, Mildred and Brendan. I don't know what you think, but we haven't mentioned this as far as I remember in connection with this game. But actually, the old Conan stories I would say are pretty good Western. Yeah. Horror to it yeah because as you were talking i was thinking of the old conan stories yeah just kind of yeah so i would agree with that and i'm and i like conan um mm-hmm. uh i think another thing too is one of the things that we did do we would start like a lot of a lot of this we knew we wanted a lot of npcs we also knew we really wanted to emphasize the interesting weapons and objects that you see in in gulong stories and a lot of times those those weapons are really elaborate but they're actually there's like a mechanical explanation for something that seems otherworldly and like like the the box in hero shed no tears where there's all these gears and stuff and you can make like every kind of weapon from it um so a, a word that you'll see in the book is through ingenious design or through clever invention and that's just sort of our way of indicating that this is like a a really high caliber invention of somebody's that still operates by mundane principles but achieves you know exceptional results mm-hmm. um and, and you'll see you. that in... oh go ahead i was just gonna say I, for anybody that's listening that isn't familiar with my work i the majority of what i've done over the past several years in my uh translating work is the high fantasy stuff so for me it's a very clear delineation like mm-hmm. i have there's an example that i used in um I have a book called uh, that I that I self publish on Amazon called Understanding Chinese Fantasy Genres, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the examples I use in the beginning of that book is a scene from one of the novels I translated. And it in this scene, there's like a part. This is toward the end of the novel where like these uh, these like motes of light fly out and they turn into suns. And it says there's a million and eighty thousand suns, and all of them are also the eye of the main character. 
And so that kind of gives you an idea of the level of fantasy that I'm used to working with. The mm -hmm. cultivation novels that I usually translate are extremely high fantasy, high magic, like bordering on mythological. So for me, the the difference between you know the more grounded stuff and then the super high fantasy stuff, I think is like it's like light and it's like night and day to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, in my mind, definitely falls in line, kind of with what you're talking about. The sword and sorcery example, I think, is really good, where there's touches of the fantastic and there is you know magic and different things like that, but not not high fantasy by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, the big reason the big reason why I um why I did why I brought the other that I brought that up as well is. When I look at the kind of th when I look at the kind of threats within um, within chapter eleven of the book, or even the kind of threats that one might see in um, in the sample adventure in the book, the Obsidian Bat, it's all very human centric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we've talked about this uh, quite a few times. Where if we have a chance to make more content um, in the future, we re we kind of do want to explore the supernatural aspect. But for this, uh, for the setting we created here, I don't even think we have a single supernatural like threat at all. It's all like no. We we know, had we so. had one character that got close to it, but that character actually actually the description became. It made it much more ambiguous what was actually going on, and it seemed to be more a product of the fire deviation. So, we and and again, I think I think I think there's a there's a line because you'll see it in a lot, especially a lot of these like old Shaw Brothers movies where some you know where a character can kind of approach something that looks supernatural through the martial arts that they're using, mm -hmm. or you know what I mean, or through some uh, you know some kind of internal energy issue going on but it's not it, it, this is like this doesn't have like ghosts or anything like that in it and we wanted it to be uh, a much more human focused kind of wuxia because i mean again that was something like, with Ogate, i i, I kind of threw the kitchen sink in with that one yeah. and and you know that's great but like when i'm watching wuxia mostly i watch like 70s shaw brothers and 90s wuxia and stuff like that so uh um, yeah and exactly like you said a lot of times there'll be enemies or or mysteries or whatever that seem like they're supernatural but in the end they kind of aren't i mean obviously there are true supernatural wuxia stuff but so yeah. many times there's there it's it's not and i do have to point out that with the eccentricities and the fire deviation eccentricities you can definitely get some quite fantastic results like you could essentially get a vampire yeah. or like some kind of werewolf or something like that and you could get some low level fantasy stuff out of that but you know, no wizards casting spells or anything like that. A, a movie that I like to point people to is Bloody Parrot because um, it had there are two. There, there's the this parrot figure in the movie that turns out to have a more mundane explanation, and there's also this woman that sort of turns into this ravis ra like this strange monstrous creature, and it just turns out that it's a product of uh, of a um, of a medication that she was given or. Uh, 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 not quite a medication, but like an elixir, but the one that's grounded in reality. And uh, and so, you know, and I won't go into detail because I don't want to spoil the surprise for people. But but that movie's like got a really, it's really a good example of what Jeremy's talking about. Mm -hmm. Where and that's the kind of logic that we were often applying to the game. Yeah. And now when it now um when it comes to as a kind of capstone. When it came when it came to the when it came to the um, fi the final version of of everything, what would you say were some of the biggest takeaways you had from developing um, Righteous Blood? Um, in what sense? I, mean, I just want to make sure I understand the question, so I don't um, <laughs> go down the wrong path when I'm answering. In, ter it. in terms of in terms of um, in terms of what what part what parts were, what parts from the from the initial design idea that you had were were um, Easy were easier to implement, and what ones were a little bit more tricky to implement from where you from where you started. Um, I can tell you. Go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead because you, you you. All right. You... Well, to be honest, most things went as I expected. I think the one thing that got me really bogged down was character creation. We had this idea of let's create this you know big network of cool characters, and we we kind of planned out how many um, of what different levels so that it would kind of scale with the the players assuming that the GM was pulling the the NPCs from our list 
and whatnot. But man, that was a lot of work. And yeah. it was like, we got, I think at a certain point we were like doing two, three a week or five a week or something. And yeah. it was just like ex, at a certain point kind of excruciating, not to create the story, but to create all the statistics and to level them up and stuff. Now, that said, it's once you make a character or two, it's actually pretty easy. Like it's yeah. it's not super difficult to do it. Uh, but just for me personally, it was it it got it got tiring to create so many NPCs. So I really hope that people use them or find them useful, considering all the work we put into them. So yeah, that was the crucible. I think was the making. I, it was such a crucible that like it improved my ability to make NPCs. By the time I went back to my next Ogre Gate project, because I was just a, I had made all these NPCs with Deathblade, and like we we you know it it, it sort of forced you to 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 get better or give up and uh um one of the things that we did do that that he mentioned that i just want to emphasize is we did say to each other okay we need to figure out exactly how many chi rank nine characters there are in the setting how many chi rank eight characters are and then that was our start that was how we went about making our characters we're like okay we know we need like 20 chi rank one characters for example i don't remember the the actual number but whatever our number was and that that was how we we did it step by step um so it's kind of got like a really cool structure to it in terms of we deliberately thought about there should only be this many chi rank nine characters there should only be this many chi rank seven characters um and so you have a really well populated jiang hu as a result also there's um, there are some interesting things that came out of it that i found out later when i was trying to plan adventures and do different things um for instance uh, we have a thing called Killing Aura and Killing Aura Darkness, which mm -hmm. essentially uh, relates to the character level and basically how many people they have killed, which is intended to be kind of like a, a way to identify how dangerous somebody is, um, or at least how much of a threat they might be. For instance, you know, if you meet somebody who has a, you know, Killing Aura of five and then a darkness of like one, then you know that they're not a person who goes around killing people a lot, but... You yeah. know, meet somebody with a killing aura of three, but a darkness of like you know fifty or something. Then you're gonna know that they're they're the, they're a killer essentially. Mm -hmm. And in any case, my point is that I went through to analyze uh, the killing aura darkness levels of different characters and whatnot. And uh, I'm not gonna reveal the secrets because I spent too much time doing it on my own. But the point is that a GM can really sort of use that to their advantage to kind of create their own characters and uh, players who are uh, able to sort of like use that will, will be able to use that to their advantage uh, in terms of, you know, for instance, if you look carefully, you will see that characters up to roughly Killing Aura 5 generally do not surpass a certain level of Killing Aura Darkness. Uh, and so I think that'll be a useful tool. And there's a lot of little little things that popped up that we never even planned planned for that kind of ended up becoming characteristics that people will discover as they sort of play the game. I don't think it's necessary to 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 explain them outright, but there's a lot of complexity in there that can be unlocked, uh, despite the fact that this is intended to be a rules light game. And I think is it, we accomplished that in that for the most part, it's not too difficult to pick up the system. Mm -hmm. but there's definitely a lot more complexity in there. Yeah. Now, with with that, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, oh. So I'm I'm always happy to come on. So yeah, it was my <laughs> pleasure. Yep. and anytime you you two see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Um, and don't. And <laughs> Jeremy, don't don't worry. We'll make sure to we'll make sure to have Diet Coke this time. <laughs> right. Uh, I finished that Coors Light much earlier, and then the <laughs> Diet Coke. So I think I'm good. They balance each other out. I get. I Kathy guess. And, uh... um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>